Today we shall continue to deepen our understanding of the concept of happiness and equip ourselves with tools and techniques from the thoughts, ideas and philosophies of deep thinkers and sages throughout history lane. Let us first start off with Abraham Maslow who propounded the model hierarchy of needs, which is an integral part of organizational behavior syllabuses around the world. Abraham Maslow said, as human beings, we experience a variety of needs, but it is only when the lower needs are met that we move on to higher ones. So he created this pyramid and said that at the base of it are physiological needs. First of all, we want food, clothing, shelter and water. Without these, there is no question of seeking higher aspirations. Once they have been taken care of, humans then move to the next step, which is safety needs. Now they wish to secure their life by taking care of their physical safety, economic safety and psychological safety. Once these have been assured, they then feel secure enough for the human adventure and look to the third need in this pyramid, which is social needs. They wish to enter into relationships and establish human connections. They seek to be part of societies and communities and experience a sense of belongingness. After that has also been met, then come esteem needs. People have been blessed with talents, abilities and resources. They utilize these in meaningful ways to win prosperity, achieve fame and become significant in society. After the fame needs are also taken care of, at the top of the pyramid is the self-actualization need. Now the primary hunger in people becomes to improve themselves and become the best version of themselves. Abraham Maslow postulated, it is in this effort for self-actualization, the people who are engaged in it, who truly experience unmitigated joy. And for people at the lower levels, there is no sustained bliss. There are only flashes of happiness. So hence, we must strive to ascend to the top of the pyramid. After Abraham Maslow, we shall move on to Martin Seligman, known as the father of positive psychology. In the year 1998, he was elected as the president of the American Psychology Association. He then announced that henceforth, there shall be a shift in the focus of psychology. He related his own experience. He was once invited to a wellness week organized by an elite school in the New England region of America. On seven days of this week were seven topics with seven guest speakers. One day the topic was depression amongst students. On the second day was alcoholic addiction. On the third was phobia of exams and so on. Seligman observed, was it wellness week or mental sickness week? He then announced 
that this must change. The goal of psychology must not be merely to study mentally sick behavior and how to eradicate it. Rather, it should be how a common person can achieve greatness, fulfillment and happiness in life. With this in mind, he proposed the three-level model for understanding the human experience. He said one is the pleasurable life, higher is the good life and highest is the purposeful life. For some people, life is all about finding gratification, companionship and indulging in pleasures. Martin Seligman said it's not wrong. This is only the pleasurable life. Beyond this is the good life. Here, people utilize their God-given talents, their abilities, their acquired qualifications and skills to do meaningful work and achieve prosperity, significance and fame in society. This, he said, is the good life. And then finally, he said, is the purposeful life. This is when people come to believe in a higher purpose beyond their self-interests. And when they utilize their abilities and talents in line with that higher altruistic purpose, they achieve the consummation and fulfillment of life. We shall now retrace our steps a little bit and go backward to the medieval ages. In the 17th century was a philosopher in England called John Locke and his ideas set into motion the American Revolution and three years after that the French Revolution. What were his spectacular ideas? He coined the term pursuit of happiness and said it is fundamental to the concept of liberty. This phrase pursuit of happiness was adopted into the American Constitution and when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Constitution, he pulled out complete tracts from John Locke's writings and included them there. John Locke differentiated between false pleasures and true pleasures. He said there are sensual gratifications that promise a lot but they are followed by guilt and a feeling of pain. There are other higher pleasures that truly fulfill. Animals, he said, do not have a choice. They are bound by their physiological conditioning. Integral to being human is the intellect to distinguish between the two and to reject the false pleasures for higher ones and subsequently even higher ones. Therefore, he said, a free society is one where people have the freedom for the pursuit of happiness. In the century after John Locke, the 18th century, came Immanuel Kant, a legendary figure, one of the most important in Western philosophy. His views, however, were diametrically opposite that of John Locke. And he said, look, when you need to make a decision in life, don't choose the criteria of happiness, because it is often a mistaken notion. You think you will get happiness by becoming a millionaire. But when you have that much, you then wish to have 3 million. And on getting that, you wish to have 10 million. It is an unending chase. Instead, he said, seek to develop virtue and follow morality. 
that will give you happiness from within. Immanuel Kant, however, was of the view that in this world, you cannot get happiness. Then why should we seek to be virtuous? He was a believer and said, after you die, in the afterworld, God will give virtuous people happiness. Because without them, then where is the motivation of virtue at all? After Kant, let us move on to the sociologist called Jeremy Bentham. He is called the father of utilitarianism. And he addressed the ethical question of how to decide what is right and what is wrong. He said, you determine the utility of a truth by its impact on happiness. If something increases the overall happiness of people, it is good. And his idea of happiness was the sum total of pleasures minus the sum total of pains. Hence, he said, as an administrator or the head of a government, if you seek to know whether a particular policy is correct or wrong, evaluate it on the criteria of whether it will enhance or decrease the combined happiness of the people. After Jeremy Bentham, let us move on now to the 19th century philosopher in America, New York, William James. He is called the father of pragmatism. He said whether a philosophy is true or erroneous should be determined by its practical results. Something that is true will have a positive, happy and blissful impact. So analyzing his own experience, he said the most fulfilling thing in life is when you find a higher purpose and dedicate yourself to it. He added a corollary there and said, even if your purpose is incorrect, but you believe in it, it will give you fulfillment. Personally, William James struggled with depression for many years of his life. And that led him to the conclusion that you have a choice when it comes to your thoughts. And human beings can reject miserable thoughts and choose happier ones. William James said, if you truly believe that life is good, your belief itself will ensure your life to become good. We, over the last two episodes, have traversed many millennia through history lane and looked at various philosophers in the five continents, ruminated over their ideas on happiness and enriched ourselves with tools and techniques they had to offer. It's possible you may be wondering why did Swamiji not talk about Vedic philosophers? Did saints in India not have anything to say about happiness? Of course not. Happiness was an integral part of the philosophy of saints and is also so vital to the Vedic scriptures. Ananda Sindhu Madhya Tavavasa Binu Jane Katamarasi Piyasa. The Ramayan states, Anando Brahmeti Vyajanath, the Taitriya Upanishad states. So after Going through all these philosophers, we will then come to Vedic thought. The reason why I took you through this entire journey is because if I had taken you straight to Vedic thought, you would not have realized its super excellent philosophic nature. 
but now you will be in a position to truly value its insights and enrich your life through them. Celebrate the biggest Diwali festival, DFW Diwali Mela 2023. One combined event of the year for the greater DFW community. Enjoy Ram Leela, Ravan Dahan, Victory Parade, Fireworks, Cultural Performances, Kids Carnival, Laser Show and more. Shopping Expo, Food Boots, and live concert by Bollywood singers, including the one and only Amit Mishra, Jyotika Tangri, Yazin Nizar, along with the High Octaves Band, and a special Diwali message by Swami Mukundananji. Save the date, Saturday, November 4th, from 5 p.m. onwards at the Cotton Bowl Stadium. For tickets, Visit RadhaKrishnaTemple.net Come one, come all to the DFW Diwali Mela 2023.